chapter four of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter four chickamauga great as was general rosecrans's success in the strategic march that brought him to the western base of lookout mountain in his natural elation he regarded it as greater still he apparently thought he had nothing more to do than move upon the flying enemy and destroy him by a flank attack or at worst if bragg had really escaped to harass the rear of his retreating army sending a brigade to occupy the deserted fastness of chattanooga he called over all the troops from the north bank of the river put crittenden's corps in motion towards ringgold ordered thomas over the gaps of lookout upon lafayette and directed mccook to advance rapidly upon alpine to harass the enemy's supposed flight to rome he telegraphed to halleck in his exultation chattanooga is ours without a struggle and east tennessee is free our move on the enemy's flank and rear progresses while the tail of his retreating column will not escape unmolested our troops from this side entered chattanooga about noon those north of the river are crossing messengers go to burnside to-night urging him to push his cavalry down it took but one day's marching to disconcert these confident expectations crittenden's force made but a short march their front being greatly annoyed by the enemy's cavalry which showed no disposition to escape unmolested mccook on reaching alpine saw no signs of the disorderly retreat he had been led to expect but on the contrary found himself entirely isolated from the rest of the army and prudently disobeying his orders to advance to somerville sent back couriers for further instructions negley who led the advance of thomas's corps in the centre pushed through the passes into mcclemore's cove and found himself not only warmly welcomed in front but perceived unmistakable signs of trouble on both his flanks the danger was even more serious than it appeared bragg had been taken somewhat by surprise by the passage of the tennessee so far below him and fastened as his mind had been upon the threatened demonstration from the north it was at first hard for him to believe that his enemy had executed this difficult and brilliant feat on his left and rear but when he became aware of the state of things he acted with great promptness and energy he did not suffer himself as pemberton had done to be shut up in his fortress at chattanooga he called buckner down from the hiawassee and with the reinforcements of two divisions sent by johnston from mississippi which he says gave him altogether an army of over thirty five thousand exclusive of cavalry he gathered himself compactly together ready to strike a blow at his enemy at the first opportunity nothing was further from his mind than the purpose of flight with which rosecrans credited him from the seventh to the tenth of september his vigilant cavalry soon reported to him the general movement of rosecrans towards his left and rear in the direction of dalton and rome he concluded that a movement upon rosecrans's rear with his own inferior force as he considered it would be extremely hazardous he therefore determined to meet him in front whenever he should emerge from the mountain gorges he could not do this and hold chattanooga at the same time he therefore drew in his troops on the seventh and eighth of september on a line running from lee and gordon's mill to lafayette fronting the east slope of lookout mountain the first point at which the federal troops presented themselves for attack was when negley supported by baird
came out into mcclemore's cove bragg had a perfect comprehension of the situation he says in his report thrown off his guard by our rapid movement apparently in retreat when in reality we had concentrated opposite his centre and deceived by the information from deserters and others sent into his lines the enemy pressed on his columns to intercept us and thus exposed himself in detail the three corps of rosecrans's army were at this time separated by intervals of a hard day's march and were each more accessible to bragg's compact forces than they were to each other the confederate general had an opportunity rarely afforded in war of taking his enemy in his fault and destroying his three corps one at a time his wisest course would perhaps have been to strike first crittenden's corps which was absolutely in the air on his right and then returning to mcclemore's cove to try conclusions with thomas but he naturally enough concluded that thomas's advance was the nearer and surer prey and might be destroyed with the least expense leaving crittenden and mccook on either flank to be dealt with later he gave orders to t c hindman on the night of the ninth to move his division forward to davis's cross-roads and from that point to attack the enemy near stevens's gap and he directed general d h hill to send or take p r cleburne's division to unite with hindman in this attack hill replied during the night that the movement required of him was impracticable as claiborne was sick and the gaps through pigeon mountain were so obstructed by fallen timbers as to be for the moment impassable bragg therefore ordered buckner to move with two divisions and execute the orders issued to hill but the plan encountered inexplicable delays hindman consumed invaluable time by arguments in favour of a change of plan which bragg refused to entertain claiborne who in the prospect of a fight had recovered his health removed the obstructions from dug gap and was ready at daylight for the march bragg joined him at his camp and they waited in intense anxiety for the opening of hindman's guns to move on the enemy's flank and rear they waited most of the day dispatching couriers and staff officers one after the other with vehement appeals for hindman to begin it was the middle of the afternoon before the first gun was heard and the advance of claiborne's division then discovered that the union troops had become aware of their danger and had retreated to the mountain passes baird had reached negley early in the morning and formed in position on his left but every moment showed them signs of an overwhelming force on all sides and they therefore sent their trains back to the mountains negley following for their protection leaving baird to hold the enemy in check when negley had placed himself in an advantageous position near the pass baird also gradually withdrew skirmishing heavily and finally formed a new line behind negley protected by the artillery rosecrans did not at first appreciate the merit of this movement he censured thomas on the tenth for not having moved farther in the direction of lafayette and on the twelfth at noon he wrote him that after maturely weighing the matter he thought negley withdrew more through prudence than compulsion bragg seeing this great opportunity lost still hoped for compensation in the destruction of crittenden's column he moved polk and w h t walker's corps in the direction of lee and gordon's mill and on the afternoon of the twelfth he ordered lieutenant-general polk to attack crittenden's corps which john pegram's cavalry had reported as on the road from lafayette to graysville and near p vine church late at night he received to his great vexation a dispatch from polk stating he had taken a strong position for defence and requesting reinforcements 
he assured him in return that he had a heavy superiority of force and still urged him to attack at daybreak he hurried to the front to join polk on the morning of the thirteenth but found no enemy before him he afterwards severely blamed general polk for this miscarriage of his plan unjustly for crittenden becoming aware of the isolation of his force had withdrawn from his advanced position the day before and on the night of the twelfth was encamped at gordon's mill having passed during the afternoon the right flank of bragg's army in close proximity each being unconscious of the presence of the other while the left and centre had thus as much by good fortune as by good management escaped a grave danger mccook was still far to the right entirely out of position he scoured the country in his front with his cavalry and finding that co-operation with thomas from the broontown valley was out of his power he retired his trains to the summit of the mountain behind him and waited with natural anxiety for his orders it was midnight of the twelfth before mccook received directions to join general thomas the fact of bragg's concentration of his army in the neighborhood of lee and gordon's mill had now become apparent to general rosecrans and the matter of mccook's return to the main body was one of vital importance concluding that it was impracticable to move along the eastern base of lookout and having no trustworthy guides to direct him by any short route mccook determined to go the roundabout way by valley head he ascended the mountain on the night of the thirteenth moving by way of henderson's gap and it cost four days of laborious and devious marching before he was able to effect his junction with general thomas by winston's gap which he claims thomas advised him was the only practicable road his advance went into camp on the seventeenth of september at pond spring seven miles from the slope of missionary ridge where rosecrans had his headquarters and fifteen miles from chattanooga hardly had rosecrans announced the retreat of bragg when he received a dispatch from halleck dated the sixth urging the importance of an immediate junction between him and burnside so that bragg and buckner if they did unite could not attack them separately this message had the usual effect of halleck's dispatches upon rosecrans and he answered with his habitual contumacious petulance your apprehensions are just and the legitimate consequence of your orders the best that can now be done is for burnside to close his cavalry down on our left supporting it with his infantry and refusing his left threaten the enemy without getting into his grasp while we get him in our grip and strangle him or perish in the attempt the mistake of general rosecrans in scattering his army to harass the imaginary retreat of the enemy had thus been compensated by bragg's delay or inability to take advantage of the flagrant error of his opponent and to rosecrans's intense relief his army found itself virtually concentrated on the night of the seventeenth it was ten days since he had sent his exulting announcement of the enemy's flight he had since recovered from the delusion but the authorities at washington were still laboring under the misapprehension into which his confident announcement had led them and he now received general halleck's dispatches with an exasperation which all men feel at having others accept their mistakes and act upon them while he was straining every nerve to pull his troops together on the lafayette and chattanooga road he received a dispatch from halleck dated the eleventh of september warning him not to go farther than dalton and repeating the rumor that a part of bragg's army was reinforcing lee the false reports of deserters sent for that purpose within the union lines in virginia together with the slight resistance made by the enemy in east tennessee and the news of the evacuation of chattanooga had for the moment entirely misled general halleck it was not until the fourteenth that general meade telegraphed him his judgment that longstreet had left lee's army and even then he did not feel sure of his destination 
but before this rosencrantz's dispatches had lost their sanguine tinge and although he said he was sufficiently strong for the enemy in his front there were indications that they intended to turn his flanks and cut his communications halleck then bestirred himself with the utmost energy to do everything possible for the reinforcement of rosencrantz he ordered burnside to move his infantry as rapidly as possible towards chattanooga he informed rosencrantz of these orders and told him in case the enemy attempted to turn his right flank to give up chattanooga to burnside and move his army to prevent bragg from re-entering middle tennessee hurlbut was ordered to send troops to rosencrantz's right with all possible dispatch grant and sherman were both informed of the situation and directed to send their available forces to memphis and thence to corinth and tuscumbia and burnside was directed to reinforce rosencrantz with all possible dispatch it is believed halleck says that the enemy will concentrate to give him battle and you must be there to help him but still with a lingering doubt as to longstreet's destination he warned foster at fort monroe to look out for him at norfolk and north carolina all these measures judicious as they were were too late to accomplish anything for the matter in hand the two great armies were massed in face of each other along chickamauga creek and nothing which could be done in washington or richmond could now materially alter the conditions of the terrible fight that was impending bragg's plan of attack was the murfreesboro scheme reversed he determined to move this time by the right flank instead of the left to take position on the road from lafayette to chattanooga attacking the union left driving it down against the eastern slope of lookout mountain and destroying it it is altogether probable that the destruction of rosencrantz's army would have been complete if the left wing could have been totally destroyed by bragg's original orders b r johnson was to cross the chickamauga at reeves bridge then turning to the left sweep up the stream towards lee and gordon's mill walker crossing at alexander's bridge to unite in the movement buckner at thetford's ford to join in pressing the enemy up the creek in front of polk polk attacking at lee and gordon's mill while hill was to cover the confederate left flank from an advance of the union troops from mcclemore's cove and in case of a movement on their part to the left to attack in flank this movement which was to have taken place at daybreak of the eighteenth was delayed all that day by the resistance of the union cavalry and difficulties arising from the bad and narrow country roads the extreme confederate right did not cross the stream until late in the afternoon by this time general hood of longstreet's corps had arrived and assumed command in place of johnson through this delay the purpose of bragg became evident to rosencrantz he improved every moment of the time by shifting the position of his army to the left this was a critical and delicate movement especially dangerous to crittenden's corps which was in the immediate presence of the enemy it was therefore resolved to move thomas's corps with the greatest caution and silence in rear of crittenden's and to place him in position on the extreme left to guard the lafayette road mccook being brought up at the same time from the right to take the place of thomas on crittenden's right these movements were accomplished successfully by hard and skilful marching although the battle had begun and was raging on the left before mccook was fairly in line on the right on the morning of the nineteenth bragg prepared to carry into execution his orders of the day before but not being aware of the extension of the union lines to the left he immediately met with unexpected difficulties in the execution of his plan in fact he was not permitted to begin the battle in his own way 
general thomas had been informed early in the morning by colonel daniel mccook that an isolated brigade of the enemy had crossed the chickamauga at reed's bridge the day before and he believed it could be cut off thomas immediately ordered general j m brannan to take out two brigades and if possible capture this wandering brigade of confederates this force soon became engaged but the resistance it met with showed that it was not a brigade but a formidable force which had crossed the chickamauga brannan reporting this baird's division was sent to his assistance and the two drove the enemy for some distance taking a good many prisoners from whom it was learned that a heavy force of confederates lay in front and to the right baird halted and before the hasty preparations which he made for an attack upon his right were completed the onset came and the battle of chickamauga began walker commanded on the extreme confederate right hood held the centre and buckner commanded the left his flank resting on the chickamauga about a mile below lee and gordon's mill cheatham's division was held in reserve the battle raged furiously for several hours against the union left so hotly was it contested that the generals on both sides constantly reported an overwhelming force of the enemy opposed to them cheatham's division was ordered to the support of walker but before it could reach him says general bragg he had been pressed back to his first position by the extended lines of the enemy assailing him on both flanks r w johnson's divisions of mccook's corps had by this time arrived to the support of brannan and baird and reynolds's division had also been placed in position by thomas the enemy taken in front and flank was driven in great confusion for a mile and a half general thomas was however too intelligent a soldier to imagine his success was decisive he ordered brannan and baird to reorganize their troops and take position on commanding ground on the road to reed's bridge and to hold it to the last extremity as he felt sure that the next effort of the enemy would be made on his left flank and rear after a respite of an hour another furious attack was made on the right of reynolds thomas sent brannan to his support j t croxton's brigade reaching reynolds just in time to defeat an energetic confederate assault at that place at this point general w b hazen greatly distinguished himself when h p van cleve had been forced to cross the road and the enemy was springing forward to take possession of it general hazen gathered together four field batteries and by an enfilading fire broke the line of the advancing confederates and saved the road towards five o'clock thomas finding his line somewhat disordered by the ardor with which his troops had been pushing the enemy determined to concentrate them on better ground feeling sure that the battle would be renewed with greater fury in the morning the hostile forces were so near together that the movement was observed by the enemy and the retiring troops of johnson and baird were forced to turn and repulse the confederates before taking up the positions assigned them and after midnight thomas having been informed by general baird that his line did not extend far enough to the left asked that negley's division be sent to him to take position on baird's left and rear this was promised him but negley was not able in consequence of a dense fog he reports to take the place assigned him during the night and in the morning while withdrawing his division he says he was ordered by general rosecrans to hold his position and only one brigade obeyed the former order as the attack from bragg's left wing was made contingent upon the advance of his right and as the right was not able to make any serious impression upon thomas's line until late in the evening the greater part of the day passed by in comparative quiet on rosecrans's right jeff c davis of mccook's corps made an advance to feel the enemy's left flank and a smart contest ensued there in the afternoon known as the battle of vineyard's farm it involved before it ended considerable forces drawn in successively from each side but though both sides met with severe loss no decided consequences resulted to the general field 
the battle of the nineteenth though terribly destructive to both sides left each army in high hopes and spirits the fact that thomas retired in the evening to better his position inspired the confederates with the idea that they had won a decided victory bragg in his report says of the final attack of claiborne on the right this veteran command under its gallant chief moved to its work after sunset taking the enemy completely by surprise driving him in great disorder for nearly a mile thomas on the contrary describes this movement as an orderly change of position in obedience to his own command executed handsomely and repulsing the enemy rosencrans telegraphed at eight o'clock we have just concluded a terrific day's fighting and have another in prospect for to-morrow the enemy attempted to turn our left but his design was anticipated and a sufficient force placed there to render his attempt abortive he says precisely as bragg says the enemy was greatly our superior in numbers the army is in excellent condition and spirits and by the blessing of providence the defeat of the enemy will be total to-morrow the battle of the twentieth did not begin at daybreak as bragg had intended and ordered he had divided his entire army into two commands assigning to the right wing lieutenant-general polk and to the left lieutenant-general longstreet who had arrived in the night from virginia and whose presence alone was to any army a valuable reinforcement polk was to assault at the earliest dawn of day and the attack was to be taken up in rapid succession to the left of the confederate line before the first light appeared in the east bragg was in the saddle waiting for the opening guns of polk dawn came and the day broadened over hill and valley and still the only sign that came to the ears of the impatient confederate general was that of the axes and of the falling trees which showed that thomas was preparing to repeat the inhospitable welcome of the day before in accordance with bragg's verbal directions to him polk had issued his orders to hill cheatham and walker immediately after the midnight council directing hill to attack at daylight and cheatham to make a simultaneous attack on hill's left walker's corps being held in reserve but hill's orders did not reach him until sunrise the thickly wooded country cut up by innumerable roads the moving trains of fifty thousand men and the darkness and fog are the reasons assigned by general polk for this failure in promptness it was half-past nine before hill reported his corps ready and after the order to advance was given further delay ensued from the fact that longstreet had during the night pushed a p stewart's division in front of cheatham making it impossible for the latter to move forward these errors were at last repaired and breckinridge's division which was nearly fresh was thrown with great impetuosity against the extreme union left the reinforcements of which thomas had foreseen the necessity and which had been promised him had not arrived only one small brigade under john Beatty was there to receive this furious onslaught it gave way and breckinridge poured in upon baird's crumbling flank and for a moment gained his rear but his progress was promptly checked by the reserve from palmer's division and with the assistance of the other reserves from brannan and negley he was driven in turn with great slaughter and the left flank was again firmly established in this fight the confederate general b h helm a brother-in-law of mrs lincoln was killed a part of claiborne's division at the same time struck the front of the union position and was repulsed all the morning a sanguinary contest raged in front of thomas which he sustained with his magnificent coolness and imperturbable presence of mind using every man under his command with infallible judgment and skill his lines were furiously assaulted at every point in turn baird johnson palmer and reynolds met in succession the impetuous onslaught of breckinridge claiborne and cheatham and although their lines were fearfully shaken they were never once broken and as thomas says the enemy having exhausted his utmost energies to dislodge us apparently fell back entirely from our front 
bragg says in his report that his troops were moved to the assault in detail and by detachments unsupported until nearly all parts of the right wing were in turn repulsed with heavy loss longstreet meanwhile on the confederate left appeared at first to have an easier task before him he had waited since early morning for orders to advance and finally convinced by the roar of battle on his right that no special advantage was being gained by polk he sent for permission to advance his own forces but before his messenger returned he found his own division commanders moving forward under direct orders from bragg which had not been communicated to him he at once swung his left wing under hindman vigorously forward stuart who commanded on his right being kept at first stationary by the ill success of the right wing and hood in the centre driving forward with his usual impetuosity and with more than his usual success it had not been longstreet's fortune hitherto to win easy victories but on this occasion for once in his life he had only to enter an open door all the day before and thus far on the twentieth rosecrans had done little but move reinforcements from his right wing to the left where thomas was sustaining the confederate onslaught but he had unfortunately delayed the promised movement of negley's division to the left of baird and his attempts at concentration after the battle had actually begun were now even too anxious and hurried he became convinced early in the morning that the enemy was moving in force upon his left and a little after ten o'clock he sent an order to mccook commanding him to make immediate dispositions to withdraw the right so as to spare as much force as possible to reinforce thomas the left he said must be held at all hazards even if the right is drawn wholly back to the present left and a few minutes later he wrote to him again to send two brigades of sheridan's division to thomas with all possible dispatch and the third brigade as soon as the lines could be sufficiently drawn up to march them as rapidly as possible without exhausting the men a little before eleven o'clock he received by an aide-de-camp a message from thomas that he was heavily pressed and the messenger added on his own responsibility the information that brannan was not in line with reynolds and that reynolds's right flank was in danger this information was incorrect brannan was in his proper position his division having been echeloned a little in rear of reynolds's line on account of an advantage of topography but rosecrans had another reason for believing that there was a gap in the line between reynolds and wood he had ordered brannan's division to reinforce baird and ferdinand van de Veer's brigade had been sent to the left in partial compliance with the order brannan had exercised his discretion in retaining two brigades in the line where he saw their presence was essential and had sent to inform rosecrans of his action but rosecrans not knowing this dispatched a peremptory order to general wood who commanded the division next on brannan's right to close up on reynolds as fast as possible and support him a courier was dispatched with the message and bidden to carry it to wood at the utmost speed of his horse general thomas j wood a veteran of the regular army received this order with great concern he had been holding his line with vigilance all the morning momentarily expecting an attack in his front he did not think the order judicious he thought brannan was in position it did not appear to him that reynolds was hard pressed but with instinctive subordination feeling that the general-in-chief must know more of the field than he did he turned to general mccook who happened to be standing beside him saying he would at once obey it and suggested that mccook should close up rapidly and prevent a gap in the line general davis was ordered to do this but he had only one brigade to fill up the wide interval left by the withdrawal of wood's division and it was at this fatal moment when sheridan davis and wood were all out of position and marching by the left flank that longstreet hurled his heavy battalions against the moving mass of the national right wing hood's quadruple formation poured into the gap 
pushing away davis's thin line like a cobweb driving wood's rear some distance in confusion taking brannan in flank and crumbling up two brigades of van cleve in the wildest confusion hindman at the same time struck sheridan who left absolutely unprotected on either flank after a gallant defence which cost the life of general w h little an agreeable poet a brave soldier and an estimable citizen gave way in some disorder general rosecrans was standing at this moment in the rear of davis's right waiting to see mccook's corps close to the left he went quickly to the extreme right to bring sheridan forward but it was too late the beaten troops rolled back upon him and overwhelmed him he rode rapidly down the dry valley road accompanied by a part of his staff and a small escort in the midst of the confusion which increased every instant the suddenness of the catastrophe for the moment quite appalled him his spirit usually so indomitable in battle under the stress of the week's enormous labour and anxiety his physical fatigue his lack of sleep and the tremendous impression of a terrible calamity suddenly occurring under his eyes without an instant's warning for the moment gave way and amid the horrible wreck and confusion of his beaten army in the tumult and disorder and entanglement of trains of artillery of mingled foot and of cavalry he lost heart and hope mccook had been swept away crittenden unable to check the retreat had followed it negley who had been put in charge of a great quantity of artillery had started for rossville taking his guns with him even sheridan the very genius of fighting unable to hold his division together was moving to the rear it was impossible for rosecrans to imagine that the rest of the army could hold firm in such disaster he rode back to rossville and not being able to persuade himself that even there the rout could be stayed he pushed on to chattanooga as he says to give orders for the security of the pontoon bridges at battle creek and bridgeport and to make preliminary dispositions either to forward ammunition and supplies should we hold our ground or to withdraw the troops into good position one of those crises had now arrived rare in the history of any country where the personal character and power of an individual become of incalculable value to the general welfare only the highest qualities in the second in command thus instantly left in charge of the abandoned field saved the army of the cumberland from irremediable ruin general thomas having about noon beaten the enemy in his front into silence and inaction yet expectant of further attack became anxious as to the arrival of sheridan's division which he had been informed was on the way to him while waiting for its arrival about two o'clock hearing heavy firing on his right and rear through the thickly wooded hills he rode in the direction of the noise and soon met the aide-de-camp whom he had dispatched in quest of sheridan who informed him that a large force of the enemy was stealthily advancing in the rear of reynolds's position this astounding news seemed at first incredible to thomas to find on the road where he confidently expected a heavy reinforcement a hostile force in rear of the union centre would have paralyzed the faculties of most generals but stupefying as the situation was thomas instantly set about to make the best of it and by one of the fortunate accidents of this extraordinary battle the means were ready to his hand two generals following their own soldierly instincts had without orders held together some fragments of their commands and placed them already in eligible positions when hood made his wild rush through the gap in the centre brannan's division struck in flank and rear had been driven back on the right but with wonderful steadiness under the circumstances had virtually retained its formation brannan held his command firmly together and bringing to it stragglers from other shattered organizations he swung back his right flank and moving about half a mile to the rear took up a good position on a commanding point of missionary ridge where for a while unsupported on either flank he held the enemy in check general wood whose withdrawal from the line had caused the break had reported with one brigade to thomas and on being informed by him that reynolds did not need support sent it under orders to general baird 
riding back for his other two brigades intending to take them also to the left he found the south end of the valley suddenly alive with rebel troops and one of his brigades in part and both his batteries swept from the field with his remaining brigade under charles g harker and part of george p buell's he immediately formed a line across the valley facing southward and without any help of artillery with the musket alone used sparingly for the ammunition was already running low he also unsupported on either flank was doing his best to hold the field when thomas appeared under the latter's orders wood's right was brought into communication with the left of brannan brannan's right occupying a commanding ridge and harker's brigade extending to the left along a spur which jutted out through the valley almost perpendicular to the general direction of the range the union lines thus facing the enemy in the shape of an irregular crescent there was still a gap between reynolds and woods which later in the day caused thomas great anxiety for fear the enemy should discover it and rush through he filled it as soon as possible with hazen's brigade which fortunately by the provident care of this intelligent and cool-headed commander was better supplied with ammunition than the rest of the field all the afternoon upon this line the battle raged with unceasing fury and terrible slaughter the right wing had disappeared the centre had been for a moment shattered and crumbled the left had fought a desperate and sanguinary battle all day but such was the indomitable spirit which the presence of thomas infused among those who were left that the slender line we have described resisted through the long autumnal afternoon the most desperate and repeated assaults of an overwhelming force of veteran confederate infantry and were at the same time rained upon by formidable batteries to which except for a few guns of brannan they could only reply with their muskets the supply of ammunition meanwhile ran so low that several assaults were met and repulsed with cold steel this fact is not derived from any boasting reports of federal soldiers general hindman himself says our troops attacked again and again with a courage worthy of their past achievements the enemy fought with determined obstinacy and repeatedly repulsed us but only to be again assailed as showing the fierceness of the fight the fact is mentioned that on our extreme left a bayonet was used and men also killed and wounded with clubbed muskets if the scattered divisions streaming over the ridge and down the dry valley road to rossville could have been brought to halt and return if general rosecrans could have displayed in this emergency one tithe of the courage and the contagious fire that his presence inspired among the cedar breaks of murfreesboro the battle might still have been his for sheridan one of the heroes of stone's river was there and had already regained such control of his troops that he was able to march them in good order to rossville and out on the road again towards the battlefield striving to gain the left instead of the right where his presence would have been decisive had rosecrans been with him and turned him even at this late hour upon longstreet's flank the battle must certainly have had a different issue for so late as three o'clock in the afternoon longstreet finding all his efforts unavailing against the stubborn resistance of brannan and wood sent to bragg for reinforcements from the right wing but was informed by him that they had been beaten back so badly that they could be of no service to him i had but one division he says that had not been engaged and hesitated to venture to put it in as our distress upon our right seemed to be almost as great as that of the enemy upon his right hindman was continually appealing to longstreet for reinforcements and desperately apprehensive of an attack on his left and rear but it was late in the afternoon before longstreet dared to risk his last reserve preston's division hindman says i have never known federal troops to fight so well it is just to say also that i never saw confederate soldiers fight better brannan's position though strong and admirably chosen and defended could yet be easily turned a practicable valley lay on his right flank through which access was easy to his rear and hindman with his superior force was able to send a strong detachment by this route which about four o'clock seriously menaced the integrity of the union line 
it was the critical instant of the day thomas's whole force had been engaged for hours and he had no reserves but assistance came at the moment when it was most needed gordon granger commanding the reserve corps had heard during the morning far to the left the roar of battle and without other orders than the promptings of his own heart had marched with j b steedman's division to the music of that martial sound his approach earlier in the day had seriously alarmed polk for his right wing and had checked for a moment the movement of claiborne and cheatham but instead of attacking the confederate right he had wisely moved to the west and down the rear of thomas's line to arrive at the point where his presence was most urgently required as hindman's advance planted its banners on brannan's right thomas indicated to steedman the work he was to do steedman moving his division into position says thomas with almost as much precision as if on drill and fighting his way to the crest of the hill on brannan's right moved forward his artillery and drove the enemy down the southern slope inflicting on him a most terrible loss in killed and wounded longstreet hesitated no longer to throw in his last reserve he sent preston with three fresh brigades to hindman and even with this large reinforcement hindman says he found the gain both slow and costly steedman reports three separate assaults made with the greatest fury and repulsed after heavy fighting before nightfall it is one of the insoluble problems of the war whether thomas might permanently have held his position which he so heroically defended on the hills of chickamauga but he was not left free to choose his course of action about four o'clock general james a garfield chief of staff arrived on the field he with the rest of the staff had accompanied rosecrans in the flood of ruin which swept the right wing from the field although they were at first overwhelmed by the news of the misfortune as they rode towards rossville the personal characteristics of the two men soon began to assert themselves as rosecrans sunk every moment deeper in the forlorn conviction that the army was utterly beaten garfield on the contrary took encouragement from every sound of battle that reached him from the east and at last he stopped short and asked permission to report to thomas on the field this was at first refused but on garfield's importunity was finally granted rosecrans taking an affectionate leave of his chief of staff as of one whom he never expected to see again in life continued his melancholy ride to chattanooga and garfield threaded the mountain bridle paths in high hope and patriotic ardor to give to thomas the full information of which he was so greatly in need and to share in the toil and success of the final struggle it was by no means a promenade of pleasure the way was beset with danger several of his escort were killed but as wood says in his report his arrival on the field showed that the road was open to all who might choose to follow it to where duty called he had commanded the very brigade of wood's division which was now holding its place on the right with such obstinate valor and it was a pleasure which paid him tenfold for his hazardous journey to see how they acquitted themselves under his sympathetic eye it was a little after the arrival of garfield that orders came from rosecrans to thomas directing him to assume command of all the forces something he had been doing unquestioned all the afternoon and with crittenden and mccook to take a strong position and assume a threatening attitude at rossville and to send the unorganized forces to chattanooga for reorganization rosecrans added that he would examine the ground at chattanooga and then join thomas and that he would send out rations and ammunition to meet him at rossville knowing that retreat with the enemy pressing so close would entail enormous loss thomas resolved to hold his present lines if possible until his movement could receive the partial cover of darkness he distributed the new supplies of ammunition which had arrived and then sent orders to his division commanders to make ready to retire to rossville as soon as night should close in reynolds being first ready to move thomas went to meet him and point out the position he intended him to take when he met with another of the most singular incidents of this abnormal day passing through an open bit of woods to reach reynolds he came upon a body of rebel infantry 
who had made their way unperceived around the extreme left and in rear of baird at this moment the head of reynolds's column appeared and thomas threw j b turchin's brigade upon the advancing confederates who were driven by a most spirited charge more than a mile over the way they had come clear beyond baird's left and out of sight losing several hundred prisoners turchin m s robinson and august willich were then posted so as to guard the roads by which the army was to withdraw and orders were sent to the division commanders to bring off their troops late as the hour was the enemy was everywhere so near that the movement could not wholly escape observation and baird johnson and palmer were successively attacked in yielding their lines and though resisting energetically suffered some losses in prisoners baird in his report expresses his confidence that he could have continued to hold his position to fall back was more difficult than to remain brannan wood and steedman left the scene of their heroic defence without trouble or molestation the final victorious charge of the confederate left wing under longstreet which was in fact a cautious advance of his skirmish line over the deserted field found nothing to oppose it early in the night thomas was firmly established at rossville the braves who had come back with him finding at rossville or on the road coming to meet him the reorganized divisions of sheridan and negley as good as ever the confederates were not aware until the next day that thomas had gone from their front in the confederate reports written several days or weeks after the fact there are the usual conventional phrases describing their final victory on the evening of the twentieth but in truth the night came down on the stubborn fight leaving the issue by no means decided the only proof of this that need be offered is bragg's official dispatch to the government at richmond after two days hard fighting we have driven the enemy after a desperate resistance from several positions and now hold the field but he still confronts us the losses are heavy on both sides especially so in our officers we have taken over twenty pieces of artillery and some two thousand five hundred prisoners he had done much better than that but this understatement of his success by a man not accustomed to diminish his own glory shows how terrible the conflict had been and how doubtful he still was of the final issue the assertions of the commanders on both sides that they everywhere met superior forces of the enemy prove only that there was but slight disparity of numbers and that the fighting was at all points except for the break on the union right unusually obstinate and determined there are no authentic reports of the confederate army for the days of battle but major e c dawes has made the following careful estimate an examination of the original returns in the war department which i have personally made shows the following result general bragg's return thirty first of august eighteen sixty three shows under the heading present for duty officers and men forty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety eight this return does not include the divisions of general breckinridge or general preston the brigades of generals gregg and mcnair or the reinforcement brought by general longstreet the strength of each is accurately given in confederate official returns the total confederate force available for battle at chickamauga was as follows general bragg's army thirty first of august eighteen sixty three for duty forty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety eight longstreet's command hood's and mclaws's divisions by the return of the army of northern virginia thirty first of august eighteen sixty three for duty eleven thousand seven hundred and sixteen breckinridge's division by his official report in confederate reports of battles for duty three thousand seven hundred and sixty nine preston's division by his official report in confederate reports of battles for duty four thousand five hundred and nine brigades of gregg and mcnair by general bushrod johnson's official report southern historical society papers volume thirteen for duty two thousand five hundred and fifty nine total seventy one thousand five hundred and fifty one rosencrantz's effective strength partly taken from official reports and partly estimated was fourteenth army corps estimated twenty thousand twentieth army corps estimated eleven thousand twenty first army corps report 
twelve thousand fifty two reserve corps report three thousand nine hundred and thirteen cavalry corps estimated ten thousand total fifty six thousand nine hundred and sixty five and he had two hundred and eight guns showing that general bragg had ready to bring into action a few thousand more troops than the total effectives of rosecrans the divisions which bragg did not employ on the nineteenth were those which thrown fresh into the fight on the twentieth formed the most efficient part of his force thomas fought his final battle against bragg's whole army with not more than twenty thousand men the losses on both sides were frightful bragg admits in his official report that he lost forty per cent of his army which would bring his killed and wounded to over twenty thousand longstreet says the strength of the left wing on going into action on the twentieth was twenty two thousand eight hundred and seventy two of these he lost not counting one brigade which had not reported to him its casualties seven thousand five hundred and ninety five in killed and wounded alone the loss on the confederate right was of course far heavier than this in proportion several brigades were almost annihilated helms lost besides their general all but four hundred and thirty two out of one thousand seven hundred and sixty three the loss of the army of rosecrans was one thousand six hundred and fifty six killed nine thousand seven hundred and forty nine wounded four thousand seven hundred and seventy four captured or missing total sixteen thousand one hundred and seventy nine the mortality among the union troops was the less as they fought most of the time in position and sheltered when it was possible by improvised works the first news which the government received in regard to the battle was conveyed in a disheartened almost despairing telegram which rosecrans at chattanooga wrote at five o'clock we have met with a serious disaster extent not yet ascertained enemy overwhelmed us drove our right pierced our centre and scattered our troops there thomas who had seven divisions remained intact at last news granger with two brigades had gone to support thomas on the left every available reserve was used when the men stampeded burnside will be notified of the state of things at once and you will be informed troops from charleston florida virginia and all along the seaboard are found among the prisoners it seems that every available man was thrown against us such was the discouraging news which reached the president on the morning of the twenty first of september his first exclamation to his secretary after reading the dispatch was rosecrans has been whipped as i feared i have feared it for several days i believe i feel trouble in the air before it comes burnside he continued instead of obeying the orders which were given him on the fourteenth and going to rosecrans has gone on a foolish affair to jonesboro to capture a party of guerrillas who were there as the day wore on the news brightened the details of the magnificent defence of his position by thomas became known the orderly retreat to rossville was reported and on the next day the safe establishment of the army around chattanooga it is the habit of most military writers when they narrate a reverse to our arms to describe the administration at washington as thrown into consternation by it even general grant referring to this event commits this error in speaking of a matter of which he could not possibly be informed he says the administration as well as the general-in-chief was nearly frantic at the situation of affairs there was certainly deep disappointment and concern at the untoward issue of rosecrans's campaign which had been so splendidly begun but to show how little of frenzy there was in the feeling and action of the president we give this letter to general halleck written immediately after the receipt of rosecrans's melancholy dispatch i think it is very important for general rosecrans to hold his position at or about chattanooga because if held from that place to cleveland both inclusive it keeps all tennessee clear of the enemy and also breaks one of the most important railroad lines to prevent these consequences is so vital to his cause that he cannot give up the effort to dislodge us from the position thus bringing him to us and saving us the labor expense and hazard of going farther to find him and also giving us the advantage of choosing our own ground and preparing it to fight him upon the details must of course be left to general rosecrans while we must furnish him the means to the utmost of our ability if you concur i think he would 
better be informed that we are not pushing him beyond this position and that in fact our judgment is rather against his going beyond it if he can only maintain this position without more this rebellion can only eke out a short and feeble existence as an animal sometimes may with a thorn in its vitals and after giving these directions the wisest possible under the circumstances as shown by subsequent history he sent to general rosencrantz this comforting and encouraging dispatch be of good cheer we have unabated confidence in you and in your soldiers and officers in the main you must be the judge as to what is to be done if i were to suggest i would say save your army by taking strong positions until burnside joins you when i hope you can turn the tide i think you had better send a courier to burnside to hurry him up we cannot reach him by telegraph we suppose some force is going to you from corinth but for want of communication we do not know how they are getting along we shall do our utmost to assist you send us your present positions at the same time he sent a peremptory dispatch to burnside in which there is a certain tone of reproof if you are to do any good to rosencrantz it will not do to waste time with jonesboro it is already too late to do the most good that might have been done but i hope it will still do some good please do not lose a moment and by another route he repeats this peremptory injunction in briefer words even on the twenty first rosencrantz had not altogether recovered the tone of his spirits he telegraphed after two days of the severest fighting i ever witnessed our right and centre were beaten the left held its position until sunset our loss is heavy and our troops worn down after speaking of the overpowering force of the enemy he continues we have no certainty of holding our position here if burnside could come immediately it would be well otherwise he may not be able to join us unless he comes on west side of the river this dispatch contained no news not already known and the president again besought rosencrantz to relieve his anxiety as to the position and condition of his army strangely enough the first encouraging word that the president received from the battlefield was contained in a richmond paper which published bragg's official report already quoted he at once telegraphed it to rosencrantz to show him he was not so badly beaten as he thought and on the same day rosencrantz having got back his habitual composure by virtue of sleep and rest and immunity from attack either at rossville or chattanooga reported from the latter place we hold this point and i cannot be dislodged unless by very superior numbers and after a great battle he asked for large and prompt reinforcements a demand which the government took into immediate consideration stanton upon whom the testy and petulant dispatches of rosencrans during the preceding year had had their natural effect in alienating his good will and impairing to some extent his confidence had for some weeks made no secret of his waning trust in rosencrans even while rosencrans was crossing the river on the last day of august secretary chase having represented to mr stanton the great importance of prompt and vigorous military action saying that the following day the amount of suspended requisitions including pay of the army for july and august would approach thirty five millions to meet which there were only five millions and adding that unless the war could be pushed more vigorously and with greater certainty of early and successful termination there was cause for a serious apprehension of financial embarrassment stanton replied that the delay of rosencrans was the principal cause of the difficulty that he commanded fully one-third of the effective force of the country and did nothing comparatively with it therefore when the news of the disaster at chickamauga arrived stanton at least had no hesitation in assigning the responsibility for it yet amid all this disapprobation of rosencrans his demand for reinforcements received instant attention troops from grant and hurlbut were already on the way but these were not enough immediately on receipt of rosencrans's dispatch mr stanton sent one of the president's secretaries who was standing by to the soldiers home where the president was sleeping a little startled by the unwonted summons for this was the first time he said stanton had ever sent for him the president mounted his horse and rode in through the moonlight to the war department to preside over an improvised council to consider the subject of reinforcing rosencrans 
there were present general halleck stanton seward and chase of the cabinet p h watson and james a hardy of the war department and general d c mccallum superintendent of military transportation after a brief debate it was resolved to detach the eleventh and twelfth corps from the army of the potomac general hooker to be placed in command of both the president's only fear was that so large a body of troops could not be transported such a distance without consuming a great deal of time but to his pleasure and astonishment the two corps numbering some twenty thousand men were brought from the rapidan to washington there embarked and carried by railway through wheeling cincinnati louisville and nashville to the tennessee and there deposited with their guns their munitions of war and all their impedimenta ready for fighting in the almost incredible time of eight days the credit of this extraordinary feat belongs to generals meigs and mccallum and prescott smith of the baltimore and ohio railroad general rosecrans in retiring to chattanooga did not consider it practicable or expedient to retain control of the point of lookout mountain commanding the tennessee river below chattanooga this point was at once seized by bragg who extended his lines from lookout mountain to the tennessee river above the town thus holding the place in a sort of demi blockade depriving it of all communication south of the tennessee river and restricting it to a long and difficult line over the mountains continually threatened by the enemy's cavalry which in the end brought it almost to the point of starvation general bragg adopted this plan of reducing the post by siege against the opinion of longstreet who advised him on the morning of the twenty first to cross the river above chattanooga thinking he could force rosecrans to evacuate that place by a demonstration upon his rear and indeed could force him back upon nashville and in case the confederate transportation was found inadequate for a continuance of that movement to follow up the railroad to knoxville to destroy burnside and thence to threaten the rear of nashville longstreet intimates that this proposition was favorably received by bragg but that general in his report insists with some indignation that he never for an instant entertained it his lack of transportation rendering it utterly impossible he stamps it as entirely lacking in military propriety it would abandon to rosecrans his entire line of communication and leave open to him the confederate depots of supplies placing bragg with a greatly inferior force beyond a difficult and at times an impassable river in a country affording no subsistence to men or animals as another reason for rejecting longstreet's scheme bragg adds that it would have left open to the enemy only ten miles away the battlefield with the thousands of wounded and its valuable trophies for nearly a month the siege of chattanooga continued bragg sealing the front and both flanks of the place against any communication the cavalry of both sides were busy one in threatening and the other in defending the slender and inadequate means of communication left open to the rear rosecrans's dispatches to the government though copious and energetic were never devoid of a certain anxiety and were continually full of requests for reinforcements and supplies the president answered him with unfailing courtesy and encouragement receiving kindly even his political suggestions rosecrans telegraphed on the third of october if we can maintain this position in such strength that the enemy are obliged to abandon their position and the elections in the great states go favorably would it not be well to offer a general amnesty to all officers and soldiers in the rebellion it would give us moral strength and weaken them very much mr lincoln replied if we can hold chattanooga and east tennessee i think the rebellion must dwindle and die i think you and burnside can do this and hence doing so is your main object of course to greatly damage or destroy the enemy in your front would be a greater object because it would include the former and more but it is not so certainly within your power i understand the main body of the enemy is very near you so near that you could board at home so to speak and menace or attack him any day would not the doing of this be your best mode of counteracting his raid on your communications but this is not an order i intend doing something like what you suggest whenever the case shall appear ripe enough to have it accepted in the true understanding rather than as a confession of weakness and fear 
the operations of the rebel cavalry though they were carried on at great expense and loss to them and were compensated by equally successful and energetic movements on the part of the union cavalry kept rosecrans continually harassed and ill at ease the failure of burnside to connect upon his right distressed him and although hooker was on his left securing the most vital points of the railroads the non-arrival of the troops from vicksburg drove him to ask in his petulant style no news from sherman are his or any other troops really coming to this army he telegraphed to lincoln on the twelfth his fear of starvation the enemy's side of valley full of corn every exertion will be made to hold what we have and gain more after which we must put our trust in god who never fails those who truly trust the same day lincoln telegraphed him one of those singular dispatches which seem full of intuitive military knowledge telling him that burnside being menaced from the east could not go to him without surrendering east tennessee i now think mr lincoln said the enemy will not attack chattanooga and i think you will have to look out for his making a concentrated drive at burnside you and burnside now have him by the throat and he must break your hold or perish sherman is coming to you he went on to say though gaps in the telegraph prevent our knowing how far he is advanced he and hooker will so support you on the west and northwest as to enable you to look east and northeast but no encouragement was sufficient to give back to general rosecrans his old buoyancy and hopefulness his dispatches continued full of premonitions of trouble jefferson davis had appeared in the other camp and made encouraging speeches rosecrans feared the rebel cavalry on his right if his mounted force were not swelled the confederate cavalry would paralyze his army and compel it to retire sherman was still too far off to be of any real help the rebel cavalry would soon overpower and wear out his and finally a dispatch of the sixteenth of october is filled with apprehension of an attempt to be made by the enemy to destroy the army of cumberland by separating it from burnside we cannot feed hooker's troops on our left nor can we spare them from our right depots and communications had we the whole of sherman's and hooker's troops brought up we should not probably outnumber the enemy this army with its back to barren mountains roads narrow and difficult while the enemy has the railroad and the corn in his rear is at much disadvantage our future is not bright by this time the government had become convinced that the supreme charge of the armies in tennessee could no longer be safely left in the hands of a general so querulous and so despondent as rosecrans had become they did not gain this impression exclusively from his dispatches charles a dana who accompanied the army as the representative of the war department had for several weeks been giving the gloomiest views of rosecrans's temper and capacity late in september he wrote that there was serious fermentation in the corps of crittenden and mccook that subordinate officers were unwilling to risk their troops in the hands of those generals but that rosecrans hated to take active measures against them as he felt he was as much to blame as they were for running away that this impression was shared by his subordinates especially by granger and garfield who blamed him severely for his conduct and his orders on the battlefield of chickamauga and for his abandonment of the lookout passes but mr dana continues rosecrans who is sometimes as obstinate and inaccessible to reason as at others he is irresolute and vacillating pettishly rejected all arguments he describes the threatening famine in the camp and as the commanding general devotes part of the time which is not employed in pleasant gossip to the composition of a long report to prove that the government is to blame for his failure i have never seen a public man possessing talent with less administrative power less clearness and steadiness in difficulty and greater practical incapacity he has invention fertility and knowledge but he has no strength of will and no concentration of purpose his mind scatters there is no system in the use of his busy days and restless nights no courage against individuals in his composition and with great love of command he is a feeble commander he is conscientious and honest just as he is imperious and disputatious always with a stray vein of caprice and an overweening passion for the approbation of his personal friends and the public outside under the present circumstances i consider this army to be very unsafe in his hands 
on the sixteenth of october he wrote nothing can prevent the retreat of the army from this place within a fortnight and with a vast loss of public property and possibly of life except the opening of the river rosencrans seems insensible to the impending danger and dawdles with trifles in a manner which can scarcely be imagined with plenty of zealous and energetic officers ready to do whatever can be done all this precious time is lost because our dazed and mazy commander cannot perceive the catastrophe that is close upon us nor fix his mind upon the means of preventing it later in the same day he reported a conversation which he had just had with rosencrans in which the general said the holding of the river to williams island was indispensable but that he could not accomplish this until hooker arrived he expected the enemy to cross the river on his left he must then fight or retreat to cumberland mountains he thought the enemy's force was rapidly increasing and that even when hooker came he would still be outnumbered he thought not less than one hundred or one hundred and twenty five thousand men was the least force with which he could go forward every day mr dana's reports assumed darker colours on the eighteenth he described the situation as desperate with no outlet but starvation or disorderly retreat the soldiers were becoming mutinous the incapacity of the commander is astonishing and it often seems difficult to believe him of sound mind general grant on october seventeenth received a dispatch at cairo directing him to repair to louisville for orders it was the intention of the government to place him in chief command and to leave it to his discretion whether general rosencrans should remain at the head of the army of the cumberland or should be replaced by general thomas mr stanton went west in person and meeting general grant at indianapolis he proceeded to louisville with him handing him on the train two orders which were identical in all but one particular both created the military division of the mississippi giving grant the command composed of the departments of the ohio the cumberland and the tennessee and in fact all the territory from the alleghanies to the mississippi river north of the limits of banks's command one of these orders left the department commanders as they were while the other relieved rosencrans and assigned thomas to his place grant without hesitation accepted the latter while they were at louisville the secretary of war received a dispatch from mr charles a dana in chattanooga informing him that unless prevented rosencrans would retreat and advising peremptory orders against his doing so upon receipt of this startling intelligence the secretary directed grant to proceed immediately to the front grant wrote an order assuming command of the military division of the mississippi and immediately telegraphed it to rosencrans informing him also of thomas's assignment to command of the army of the cumberland and sent a telegram to thomas urging him to hold chattanooga at all hazards thomas promptly answered we will hold the town till we starve rosencrans on receiving these orders gave over the command to thomas and left chattanooga on the morning of the twentieth shortly after daylight before the change became known he said afterwards convinced that this would excite profound sorrow and discontent in the army of the cumberland which my continued presence after it became known would increase and that this would be detrimental to the public service in the presence as it were of the enemy i determined to forego the gratification of receiving the parting adieus of those with whom i had shared so many toils and dangers this was probably an unnecessary precaution general thomas had served with that army quite as long as general rosencrans and his qualities exhibited in camp on march and on the field of battle were not such as to inspire any emotion of sorrow or discontent at his promotion End of chapter four